Hello and welcome to this video where we're going to be taking a look at Spectralayers Pro 8. So this was released yesterday at the time of recording, uh, a couple of days before this video goes out. And I just wanted to take you through some of the new features so you can have a listen and make up your own mind about uh, whether it's for you. Uh, both, of course, whether or not Spectralayers is a thing that you have at all, other than the uh, cut down version of Spectralayers, which was featured previously on the channel, or if the version 8 update is going to be the thing for you. So certainly the things we're going to be looking at are the new features and some improvements. This isn't going to be a comprehensive review of everything that Spectralayers does. Um, there's certainly some information elsewhere on the channel about that because you can look at the included Spectralayers 1, which comes with certain versions of Cubase, which gives you some of the functionality that this has. And then, of course, this has got uh, plenty more. But there's some new features which I think you probably want to have a listen to because the examples you get when you're presented with this in tutorials, etc., by some people may not be the most representative things of what you'll encounter in the real world. So I've just picked some real world examples, just going to run you through them. You can make up your own mind because um, that's probably the best thing we should all start to do more of, isn't it? Is make up our own mind rather than be told what uh, what to think by, uh, well, no, obviously not by people like me. I mean, if I tell you it, it must be amazing. Uh, anyway, let's get into it, starting off with D-Bleed. So here you can see we're in Cubase and what I've done is I've actually set Spectral Layers to be the editor for a couple of these events here. Now, if you're not sure about using it this way rather than a standalone way, it's certainly generally pretty well integrated. And if you want to open up anything in Spectral Layers, you can just click on the audio part in question and either go to audio extensions and then spectral layers or if you control and right click you can go to extensions and then spectral layers either way that will open it up and effectively set the audio editor to be spectral layers so you can see in this case if i click on the overhead it's just in the standard audio editor if i click on the kick drum then it's opened up in spectral layers because that's what we want to do now uh first things first this is a drum kit that i did not record um to me this does not sound good this is a really bad example of a recording of a drum kit and this was done in a commercial studio who i will not name but i i if if anybody gave me this at, as an a level project i would have said do it again because it's it's got all the hallmarks of a terrible uh drum recording but on the upside it's going to be ideal for what we want so the the d bleed function is designed to remove bleed and i guess stop you having to put gates etc on different parts of the kit and this would be ideal if this works perfectly this is going to be an amazing feature I, i'm not sure we're there yet but you can listen to it and decide for yourself so here we have the snare drum i'm just going to zoom in on this so you can see it and you can see there's some bleed from the kick drum so actually what i'm going to do is i'm going to move this up so the snare and the kick are next to each other and if we listen just to this snare. So the snare hasn't come in yet. That's just bleed. And then in it comes. I mean, yeah, it's just ringing. It's horrible, etc. We're just going to have to just table that because it sounds really bad to me. Anyway, we've got plenty of bleed you can hear here. Now, if we go to the kick drum track, we can hear the kick drum. Again, world's worst kick drum. Sounds horrible, but that's uh, that's just what I had to hand. And often you'll have to deal with terrible sounding uh, audio if you weren't responsible for it, etc. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the snare drum here and then we're going to use the kick drum to de-bleed it. So we'll try and remove that from there. And this is reasonably easy to do. So what I'm going to do is move this out into its pop-out window. So here we can see it a little bit better. So we're on the snare track here and we're going to go to process and then de-bleed. We kick that and then we pick the source and that will give you the other uh, audio layers which you have open, which in this case is only kick. So we only get the choice of that. We've got sensitivity and reduction ratio, which you can play around with. Now, obviously, I can't go through every possibility here, but 
the sensitivity does what you would expect, how sensitive it is to that bleed, and the reduction ratio is how much it reduces it by. I'm just going to put it to 100% because that's the default, and also that's the maximum effect, which if it sounds good, that's what we'd want. So we click OK, and it does some processing. You'll see it takes a few seconds to get through that. And what it's doing is trying to work out where the kick has affected the, the snare track and effectively apply some intelligent processing to it. Now, all of this is done via, well, they say AI. It's, it's machine learning. It's a certainly a complicated process, and it allows us to do things which weren't possible 15, 20 years ago, certainly. But let's see how good it is once it's finished processing this. So we can see we got a reduction in there and I'm going to go back to the normal view because then we can just do this and let's have a listen to the snare again. And you can probably hear that that's been reduced. So let's, uh, I've set something up to allow this to be more easily compared. So I'm just going to undo that uh, and then I've used track versions here because it makes it much easier. So I've got a the original one with the bleed, which is here. And then I actually did a reduced bleed one and just put this down straight to there. So that's a render of an earlier session. So that's not the, uh, the version that we just did, but it's the same settings. It just means we can compare it easily because sometimes... ARA plugins can have uh, some kittens. So this is the reduced bleed one. Now, so far, we've got reduced bleed, but listen to the snare. Now, obviously, you say we are dealing with the world's worst snare sound, but the reduced bleed compared to the original, you can see the difference here. You see that coming back in. Now, just concentrate on the tail end of this because I it, it sounds to me like it's not gating, but it sounds like a gate flicking on and off. And it's, of course, because the kick drum happens in this little bit here. There's a little bit of a transient, etc. But once we've got it back on the reduced bleed... So while this is undoubtedly impressive, I'm hearing some artifacts in there. Now, whether or not there'd be a problem in the context of a mix, I'm not so sure, particularly because I'd probably be gating that anyway. Um, so it might reduce some of the inevitable things that you happen with. Sometimes you have bleed where you've got two things happening at the same time. So if you had kick drum and snare happening at the same time, and then it will reduce that uh, significantly without affecting it but certainly tails on things like that when you have a transient of the the bleeding thing coming through that's going to be very difficult to deal with so you can try this out obviously if you have access to this but it's it's the kind of thing where really i don't think you necessarily get get shown this but say in the context of a mix i'm not sure it would make that much difference this kind of uh little noise etc happening this kind of glitch because i'd if it was that sound, I'd be gating it heavily anyway, and it would be down in the mix, etc. So it's easy to zoom in on these things you know, in an audio manner and get, oh, you know, that that's terrible. Often things like that, once they're in a mix, they don't make that much difference depending on the context of the mix. Obviously, if you've got something where the drums are really exposed, that's going to be noticeable. If you've got it in the middle of a pretty loud, noisy rock recording, maybe not so much. But again, it's for you to decide. Next up, let's take a look at EQ Match. So here I've got two guitar loops. I've got this one which I like the sound of, the guitar A major one, and then I've got one which maybe I want to use the parts of, but I don't like the tone of it so much. It's a bit too hard sounding, etc. So let's see if EQ Match can help us out here. Again, just going to open this out. And what we're going to do is to sample the A major guitar, this one here, and then try and apply the EQ from it onto here. So first things first, let's just select a decent length of it. And then we go to process, EQ match, and we want to register EQ. So this analyzes that. 
doesn't take long to do it. And then we're going to click on the A minor one, go to process, EQ match, and then EQ match. Comes up with this here. Now we've got this match ratio here where you can control how much strength there is in that application of that. But I'm just going to hit OK. That's applied that to there. I'll close that down. And now we'll hear what this sounds like afterwards. Compared to... So I think that works pretty well. I've tried it on a few things. Generally, you get the right kind of idea. It, it makes things sound like it. Now, obviously, in this case, those two guitar parts weren't the same thing. It was still quite a sort of chunky guitar part, but it sounded tonally much more like it. If you've got parts where the music is closer and it's just the, the EQ between the two, the results can be, can be better. But I just picked these two reasonably difficult things to match from a uh, Steinberg sound bank as it happens so that's something which i think has been around for quite a while because i seem to remember soundforge having something similar where you could you could learn an eq from one and then apply it clearly this is uh, a more complicated uh piece of uh, encoding there etc but match eqs are the kind of things that have been around for a while but we'll maybe one day we'll do a a, a knockout and possibly resurrect Soundforge 5 or something like that and see if my memory is as bad as I think it is. And next up, let's look at Ambience Match. So Ambience Match is purporting to add the ambience of uh, an environment to a recording. So what we're going to do is add this to Spectral Airs. Uh, once it's there, I'm just going to remove our dear friend, the guitar there. So that's no longer present. And then we're going to put in Ambience Match 02. So I've got a voice over here, which I'd recorded. Um, it's just me talking, as are a lot of things. And here's some audio to apply the ambience to. So all that is there. And this ambience is actually all I did was open the window in my studio and wait for the traffic to come by. I just put the mic on Omni and we've got a bit of low level. Depending on where you are, you may or may not be able to hear that, but it's just, it's just traffic noise. I live pretty close to a, a main road. So if I don't keep my windows closed, I get traffic noise. So let's see how it deals with this. So firstly, here's our ambience. And in fact, we can see that there. And let's just go to process, ambience match and register ambience. So first things first, I need to select this. And we've got a fair bit of it to select. So process. Ambience match and register the ambience, and then it's been registered. And then now we click on our voiceover where we want to add it in, and lo and behold, ambience match. And we can see that noise is present there, and it adds it in. So now let's see if it sounds like I recorded that voiceover with the window open. And here's some audio to apply the ambience to. So that sounds like it to me. Say, so I'm not sure it's the most uh, challenging test of it. I've actually used it in some slightly weird ways as well. I, I put it on um, some snare drums and then you've got this stretched out snare drum sound going throughout the whole passage, which isn't the way it's supposed to be used. You're supposed to use it in an area where there isn't much sound happening and then it, it's, I guess, kind of resynthesizing that sound and passing that into your audio. But I think there's probably some more creative uses of it uh, not in the way that was intended, because there's the ability to, say, stretch out a sound or a segment of sound across a whole area and do some kind of synthetic resynthesis of uh, a small fragment of sound, but certainly not in the way you would do with like granular synthesis, etc. It's a little more uh, unusual than that. But next up, let's have a look at selection of harmonics. 
So here I have a chord in just a C major chord, which was played in Retrolog. Now, harmonic selection is a pro feature and has been for a while. So if you weren't aware of this, it's quite useful because you can go on harmonic selection and then you pick, let's say, that one there. And that picks out the middle note of this chord in this case, which is quite useful because this actually ties in with another feature which is, has been added, which we'll, we'll look at in a second. But... On top of that, if you haven't selected using that, you can select, let's say, using frequency selection, and then you can select harmonics. So here you can pick the harmonics you want to select. So it, it basically does the math for you, and it's saying master rank is one. So in other words, we've selected harmonic one. Let's select all these others. And in this case, it's going to do that. You click OK, and you see they all get selected, which is the same as if you'd selected using the harmonic selection tool. Here we've got master rank is one, so I selected the bottom one, but if I select master rank is two, so now having selected master ranks two, if I select that harmonic there, you can see that it selects the harmonic below. So this is quite useful, particularly when you've got a harmonic down in the noise floor uh, and the, the easiest place to draw physically becomes um, not so easy because it may misselect, etc. So it, it can be quite useful being able to do this kind of thing. The other thing which this ties into is that now it's possible to make changes in terms of musical divisions, which is quite nice. So at the moment, we've got this up or down, which we can select in percent. But if we pick musical notes, now that was a C major chord. But if I pick minus one you can hear that it's changed to a minor chord. So being able to select harmonics is a really important tool if you're going to do any musical editing uh, because most tones that you hear are comprised of not only just the fundamental but harmonics as well. And being able to grab them without doing the maths and being able to grab them flexibly in the way that we now can in Spectral Ares is pretty useful. So it's not earth shattering but it's a useful uh, workflow improver. Next. Let's take a look at the voice denoiser. Okay, so here I've got an example which is just me talking with some music underneath it. Here's my voice with some music in the background. Yeah, you get the idea with that. So that's just got that music there. Now, let's see what Spectral Airs can make of it. So again, let's add that event in. And let's just remove Retrolog for the time being. And then... Take a look at what we have. So if we go back to the beginning. Here's my voice. With now here you can see, for instance, where the bass drum is. It's really clear. And then you can see all the harmonics of my voice, inflections, etc. And then the music carrying on after that. So let's see what it does with that. So let's go to process and voice denoiser. So we'll change it into music mode. And let's just hear what it has to do with that. And you can see straight away, the music is pretty much gone. And if we go back to the beginning and play it, let's hear what we've got. Here's my voice with some music in the background. That does a pretty good job. I don't think it's possible, certainly with today's technology, to be able to do it without some kind of artifacts because obviously the, the music and the voice have the same frequencies in them uh, as you could see by the way things crossed over in the spectrum diagram you were looking at. Uh, it's, it does a pretty good job. Uh, obviously tools such as Zoom, etc., that kind of thing, they can remove music from the background, but they have a fairly poor quality, so it's pretty difficult to hear what they're doing uh, to the, the signal that you want. Um, I haven't got any other plugins which can do this this well. The nearest thing to it is RX-7 Voice Denoiser, which I'm going to play you now, the difference between that and Spectral Air's attempt at doing this. So here's the original. Here's my voice with some music in the background. Here is the uh, Spectral Air's 8 version. Here's my voice with some music in the background. 
and you can certainly hear bits of the music kind of breaking through when the voice is. And then here's the RX-7 version. You can see the music is still present to a degree, although it's been reduced. Here's my voice with some music in the background. Although it's not really intended for that kind of thing, you can get a result. So you can see and hear that the music is reduced and the voice isn't quite as affected, but Spectralayers definitely knocks out the music almost completely. But what about with noise? So here's a similar test. Here's a voice with noise in the background. And here's my voice with some noise in the background. So here you can see it's less of a repetitive thing and you've just got these frequencies which are more or less constant throughout. So again, we've got a different mode and we can go to voice denoiser and this time we'll change to noise and hit OK. And again, we can see the noise is pretty much gone although it carries on through the voice here and then just fades out. But if we have a listen to that, we can hear it's pretty much gone and then here's my voice with some noise in the background and you can hear that noise to a degree. Let's compare that with RX-7's version. And here's my voice with some noise in the background. So again, it's a pretty similar result. So RX-7 does a reasonable job, but it doesn't get rid of it to the same degree that spectral layers can even though that was put all the way up to the max and tuned to try and help it work properly. There are, of course, artifacts still on the voice. In this case, you can hear changes in the tone of the voice and the noise still creeps through. But again, this is the kind of thing that just wasn't possible a, a few years ago. Uh, this, again, is the benefits of lots and lots of machine learning and complex programming. When they say it's AI, I think that's stretching it a bit. It's, it's, yeah, maybe I'm being picky, but it just makes it sound like it's an alien technology and it's not. It's, it's complicated, but it's simpler than alien technology. Right, next, let's have a look at reverb reduction. So here again, we've got uh, one of Steinberg's samples, Cubase content. Pretty reverby kind of breakbeat type drum from back in the day. Let's try removing the reverb from it. Now here we are going to select the entire sample. We'll go to process and then reverb reduction. And let's try just 100% reverb reduction and see the effect. But we can see there's less happening here. And when we play it back, So again, let's compare the original with the Spectralose version and another plugin's attempt at removing the reverb. So here's the original. And now the Spectralose version. We can certainly tell there's been some effects on the dynamics and the attack of that sound in places. And here it is with RX-7's D-reverb. So again, uh, it, it depends which one you like the sound of. This varies drastically depending on what samples you're using it on. Some of them works really well, some of them not so well, some of them really, it affects it really badly. And the same has always been true for RX-7 as well. Uh, drum loops tend to show up the kind of processing uh, being highlighted where there are those big dynamic attacks. So attacks and so on, you're really sensitive with your ears to those having been changed and particularly because they're inconsistent across time. So, you know, one bar may sound different to another bar. Um, it's There's obviously lots of very complicated maths being applied to these signals, but it's, it's I think no one's technology is quite there yet, is it? Because it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. And while they do, again, a job which 15, 20 years ago just would have been the stuff of a madman's dreams, it's it's still not quite there yet. But again, if it's the only version of this audio you've got and you can do some processing, maybe reduce the amount that you're reducing it by, uh, maybe you can get away with it. 
Uh, the final little improvement we're going to look at is the uh, eraser and amplifier tools. Now, they've been given limits, so they don't go too far in the upwards or downwards direction, which is a handy little touch. So let's just take a look at that. So here we have just a simple synth sample. And you can see the filter coming down, which is, is quite a nice touch. But we've got this limit here. So if I pick the limit of 32 dB, in fact, let's make it a bit higher than that because otherwise it won't be apparent. So let's make it 14 dB. I've got my eraser on and no matter what I do to this here, it won't go below that. So let's make that limit a bit lower, minus 23. And you'll see now it will do that. But even if I keep going on this, it's not going to reduce it below that. So it means you it can be heavy-handed with your eraser without the, the results being heavy-handed, which is quite nice. Let's just undo that. And the same goes for the amplifier. So with the amplifier, we can pick a limit and we'd, we'd need a higher limit than that. So let's say minus 12. And no matter how many times I go over some of these, they're not going to go above that. So that works quite nicely and just makes that tool a little easier to use. A nice touch with these tools is that you can pick the limit from an existing harmonic. So let's pick the limit here and decide that we want all of these harmonics to be at the same volume as this first fundamental one. So let's click that. It gives you the level so you can see here it's picked up minus 13.8. And now when we use the tool, you can see that these are all being brought up to that same level as that, which will change the sound of this. So let's just try and make that a little bit more graceful in its descent. And now when this is played back, it's made a bit of a difference to that. And that makes this tool much easier to use. The same works also for the Razor. So again, we can pick the limit and let's say I want to set those back down to something more sensible. So there is 36.9. And now when I run through these, it will decrease those. Although it's a little harder to pick those. And as you can see, the, the tool's not working exactly perfectly on there. It's a little harder because this is quite vague. So it's it's a little harder to get that right. And if you're picking from these higher levels, but it certainly gives you a good idea of what you're aiming for. So you can just click pick limit and say, let's pick those. And then now you can see they're much more consistent. So this allows that kind of work to be much easier to do rather than relying on, on guesswork or multiple passes with the same tool. So there you have it, my review of Spectralayers Pro 8. And I say review, what I've tried to do is to present you with some of the new features in action and you can make up your own mind about them. Uh, I don't think this will necessarily be for everybody because a lot of people will be totally happy with standard workflow that you get in a DAW or audio editor just using amplitude-based tools. But if you're the kind of person who is working with one-off archival material or live recordings, the kind of thing that just can't be recreated. The tools which Spectral Egg gives you will enable you to improve and fix these in ways which are just not possible with an amplitude-based audio editor. In addition, if you're the kind of person who makes uh, avant-garde soundscapes from found sounds and wants to take things to the limit of audio mangling, Spectralayers definitely gives you the tools to create sounds which have never existed before uh, in, a, in a very visual uh, and potentially intuitive way. The artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning tools which have been introduced with this version of Spectralayers definitely work. And as I said earlier on, they are the kind of things which were uh, the madman's dreams just 10, 15 years ago. People wouldn't have thought it was possible to do the things which now you can do uh, in a fairly straightforward and quick, mundane way. Uh, removing noise, removing music, and removing bleed, all of which work well. They all have some compromises as seen earlier on, but I think in many cases in the context of a mix, etc., that wouldn't be too much of a problem. The area that I do 
have a bit of a problem with is the user interface. Because Spectral Layers was inherited from another company or bought from another company, it's inherited uh, keyboard shortcuts and behavior, which isn't the same as a Steinberg product. And as somebody who's used Cubase for um, more than half my life, uh, it's it's difficult when you just have to think just for a fraction of a second, oh, I'm in this window, so now I need to do this to zoom in or to zoom out, etc. that kind of thing. I know I said this in a previous video and got some pushback about that, but I, I really think there should be a, a Cubase mode option which follows all the Steinberg user interface paradigms, which would then mean you would just work seamlessly between the two. Certainly, I know when I use Premiere Pro, I changed all the keyboard shortcuts for the tools that I use to follow Cubase uh, paradigm, and then it just works seamlessly, and I don't have to think I'm in a video editor or I'm not, etc. So that's that's probably the biggest bugbear. I found the ARA integration in terms of keyboard shortcuts is a little clunky. I'm not sure if that's an ARA thing or if that's just I'm useless thing. I've yet to experiment uh, a little further and find out exactly where that's happening. But overall, I hope you found this a useful look into Spectral Layers Pro 8. And if you have, please like and subscribe. And we'll see you again soon for more Music Tech Tuition. <laughs>